If you have your Bible, I'm in Psalm 1 is where we'll begin today. Psalm 1. Good to see you in the Lord's house. Amen. I believe I saw uh, C.J. Williams here. Is there, did I see him right in the house today? Wave at me, C.J. Where are you? All right. I know he's around here. He is back from... Am I overlooking him? He's a... Okay. He may be working in the kids' hall. C.J.'s back. I know his mama is happy to have him back from basic training. Amen. <laughs> Very glad to have him. Amen. So, yeah. So, continue to wrap C.J. up in your prayers on that journey that he's on. Amen. Amen. Continue to remember our people who are deployed and who will be deploying soon for military service. Amen. Continue to pray for Mark Glass, Jr. Pray for him. Pray for Jason Hall. And pray for Aaron Connor, our chaplain. Keep them lifted up to the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bible, I'm in Psalm 1. And I want us to read together from the Word of the Lord today. We've been covering some ground in this Back to School Review series. And we talked the first week from Revelation 4. And we talked about some solid truths that get us through shaky times. And we learned three great truths that we always need to remember. Number one, God is still on its throne. Number two, Christ is still with his church and number three, God's people still win in the end. Amen? And those are great promises, and we can anchor our heart in those promises. Last week, we talked about the greatest danger that we face in these end-time days, this period just before the return of the Lord. And we talked about that the danger is that we would lose our passion for Christ, we would grow lukewarm in our walk with God, and we would fall away from our commitment to Christ. That is a great danger in the day that we live in. The Lord warns us in 2 Thessalonians 2, before the Lord returns, there will be a great falling away. Say falling away. And we talked about that last week. And more importantly, we talked about how to be sure you don't fall away. How to be sure you do not lose your passion or your grip on that. And so we talked about that last week. And this week, we're going to continue to walk through this review, some basic things. Last week, we said one of the best things we can do in order to not fall away from our commitment to Christ is to be faithful to the house of God. I'm glad you're in church this morning. Amen? I'm glad you're in the Lord's house. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 92 says we can be planted in the house of the Lord. I want to be planted, amen? If you're going to be fruitful, you've got to be planted. Say planted. Planted in the house of God. Planted in the church. And that's where we want to be. And so we're going to talk about this morning, how do, we, how do we move forward with that? We ought to gather in worship, and that's what we're doing today. But we also need to grow together in God's Word. And today I want you to look at Psalm 1 because it underscores the importance of the Word of God in our spiritual growth. Amen? So I want you to read it with me today as we put that on the screen. Psalm 1. In fact, I want you to read it aloud with me, if you will. It's a beautiful psalm. It's one every Every believer ought to memorize, in my opinion. I think this is a great passage every Christian ought to know. It's full of great encouragement and promise. Read it aloud with me. Will you join me? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. May God bless the reading of his word. And his people said, Amen. Amen. I want to give you three principles today that I think will help us as we grow in our relationship with Christ related to God's Word. And the first one is I want you to be aware the psalm warns us against the corrupt guidance of the world. Say that with me. The corrupt guidance of the world. 
The world is not short on advice today. If you are on social media, if you have a Facebook or a Twitter or any kind of account uh, on Instagram or anything like that, you are constantly bombarded with advice. (laughs) People are always willing to lend you their advice and give you their opinion on how they think you ought to do anything and everything. Amen? Uh, there are always people willing to offer their advice, amen? We need to be careful whose advice we take. The scripture warns us against walking in the counsel of those who do not know and love the Lord. We need to be careful. If you want to have a blessed life, you cannot just take any road. Not every direction will lead you to a life of blessing and wholeness. If you want to live a blessed life, you've got to walk in the way of God's word. Be careful whom you take as your counselor. Have you ever noticed when you're facing trouble, there's always people who will come along and say, well, if I was you. (laughs) And we need to learn how to smile back and say, but you're not me. (laughs) Amen. Because the reality is this, whenever someone is giving you advice, they probably only know about one third of what they think they know about you or your situation. They're looking from the outside and they see a few of the facts, but there are a lot of the facts that you know about your life and your circumstance that they don't know about your life and circumstance. And I want to tell you a lot of times what we have to understand about each other is this. If you knew as much about their business as they know about their business, you might make a different decision than you would make based on what little you know about their life right now. The Bible has some advice for us. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Mind your own business. <laughs> Do you know that was in the Bible? That's in the Bible. Amen. So uh, if, if someone's not soliciting advice from you, be careful about volunteering that advice. Amen. Amen. The Bible warns us about putting our nose in other people's business where it doesn't belong. It's a good way to come up with a broken nose. Amen? (laughs) Amen. If you are searching for advice, if you're in the market for good advice, if you're seeking counsel, the Bible warns us, number one, against the corrupt guidance of the world. Number one, he says, walking not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's the first thing he says. Be careful whose advice you take. A lot of advice is free, but you usually get what you pay for. Amen? (laughs) It's amazing how Christians will take advice about picking a spouse, raising a family, running a business, or leading a church from secular leaders who do not know God. I'm always shocked at Christians who will just go and Google for an answer, and they don't even look to see what source that information is coming from. Or they will pick up a magazine or a book in a bookstore, and that author may not have the foggiest idea about what it looks like to love God or live for God. Be careful about taking advice. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And the word ungodly here doesn't mean someone who's especially wicked. The word godly just literally means not godly. They don't love the Lord. They don't know the Lord. It doesn't mean they're a bank robber or some notorious sinner. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means they live their life without regard for God's word and God's wisdom. They're not factoring in the biblical worldview when they make decisions or choices. And you as as a believer, are doing that. And so don't listen to people who aren't factoring in God's word to the decision-making process. We are not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The Bible has a lot to say about our walk. Say walk. We're to walk in love. We're to walk in wisdom. We're to walk humbly with our God. We are to walk in love. We're to walk worthy of our calling, the Bible says. We are not to walk in the advice of those who don't walk with God. Why would you follow someone who's never been to where you want to go? Stop polling people on Facebook to make life decisions. Amen? Seek godly counsel from people that you trust, who know and love God, who will guide you in the way that you ought to go. Amen. So we are not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Number two, he said, nor standing in the way of sinners. Say that with me. We're not standing in the way of sinners. Say stand. 
If you walk with people who don't acknowledge or honor God, you will end up taking your stand with the sinner. You will stand on moral issues with the world rather than with Jesus. I want to tell you there are all kinds of issues in the world today that are not really moral. You're free to have whatever opinion about them you think is best. But there are some issues that the Bible speaks very definitively to and clearly to. And where the Bible is clear, the church ought to be clear. Amen. And where the Bible is doesn't say a lot or affords liberty, we ought to afford one another liberty. And where the Bible is silent, a smart preacher will be as well. Some people want to comment about everything. Some people want me to comment about everything. <laughs> Pastor, why don't you talk about this? Because I can't find a verse about that. And this desk is for preaching this book and this book alone. Amen. That's all it's for. It's for preaching the word of God. Amen. So if I can't find how this book touches it, I'm going to stay off of it. Amen. This is my assignment. Let somebody else speak to the rest of it. Amen. Amen. We are not to, however, take our stand where the world stands on moral issues. And I hear people often talk about things and they'll say, oh, that's a political issue. Be careful. Some things that look like a political issue are actually a moral issue, a spiritual issue, and they are addressed in the Word of God. Abortion is not a political issue. Euthanasia is not a political issue. Same-sex marriage is not a political issue. These are all things the Word of God addresses. God speaks very clearly to these kinds of things. And we are to stand where God's Word stands or else we're standing in the way of sinners. Amen. When God's word is clear about something, we are to be clear about it and to take our stand there. Amen. So we're to not stand in the way of sinners. Say the way. The Hebrew word is derek, D-E-R-E-K. It implies your whole manner of life, what directs you and what produces your decisions. Our whole manner of life is not to look like the sinner who breaks God's commands and ignores God's principles. Our entertainment choices begin to look like the world if we're not careful. We lose all sense of modesty or appropriateness in our dress. Our language begins to slip and become more profane and crass. Before long, we look just like the world. We sound just like the world. We act just like the world. And when someone calls us out on it, we say, what's wrong? Times have changed. Don't be so old-fashioned. I want to tell you, I want to be as old-fashioned as this book right here. I want to be in line with God's Word when it comes to moral issues. The Word of God teaches us to do that. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. Psalm 1-6 said, for the Lord knows the way. Say the way. The way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Not only will those who don't live for God pass away, that whole way of life is going to be shut down one day when the Lord comes back. When Jesus reigns in his kingdom, that way of living that the world does now, that way of ignoring God's commands and doing whatever they want to, that whole way of life is not even going to be an option anymore. That's going to be done away with. Jesus is going to rule the earth. He is going to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we are going to obey him and we're going to do what he says. And the only people who aren't going to obey him and do what he says are going to be excluded from that kingdom. And if you don't want God in your life or you don't want him very close to you, if you don't want to obey God and follow God, there's only one other zip code you can live in. And it's hot there all the time. Do you hear me? The way of the ungodly will perish. Amen. We have to go God's way. It's the only way that leads to life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one we follow. Uh, that's why Paul said in Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. We're following in the way of Christ and his footsteps. That's the way we are to go. Number two, notice the stand. Say the stand. Don't stand in the way of sinners. We don't stand where they stand. We don't live life the way they live life. 
And we don't stand where they stand. Be careful when your cultural stand looks like the world's. Romans 12, 2 says, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. That's the Phillips translation of that. A so-called church or Christian who stands with the world on moral issues is not standing with the Lord. You can't do both. The world says you're standing on the wrong side of history. I'd rather be standing on the wrong side of history than stand before God one day and find out I was standing on the wrong side of eternity. Amen. Lord, help us. There's something worse than being out of step with the world. It's being out of step with the word of God. That's the great danger we need to be careful of. Because if you stand in the way of sinners, if you walk in the counsel of the ungodly, eventually you'll take the last step. You'll end up sitting in the seat of the scornful. That's the last one. Sitting in the seat of the scornful. Notice the digression. You go from walking to standing to sitting. You're walking, you're still making progress, but then you're sitting, you're standing, you're not making any movement, and then you sit down. If you sit down, not only are you not moving, you don't plan on moving for a while, right? When you sit with a scornful, you have taken a position against God. You have taken a position believing and acting and doing what God's word says we ought not to do. We start by listening to the world's advice. We slowly begin to think more and more like the world. Finally, we become comfortable being like everyone around us. In the end, we Fall, end up following in with this wrong crowd. The company gets worse along the way. You move from being with the ungodly. People who are basically good folks, they just tend not to acknowledge God's word or principles. Then you end up with sinners. Those are people who actively break God's law. They know God's law and they just break it. They do what they want to anyway. They know better, but they don't do better. So you move from good people who live a good life, who just tend to not honor God with their decisions or factor him in. Then you, your crowd gets a little worse. You're hanging with people who violate God's word, know God's law, and won't live according to it. And then the third step is the crowd gets a little worse yet. And you find yourself sitting with a group of people who not only don't acknowledge God, not only do they break God's law, they are scoffers. They mock and ridicule and make fun of people who actually love God and hold to biblical commitments and hold to a biblical worldview. And you find yourself sitting among them. And the sad thing is I see this happen even to people in the church. Well, you know, I know the church says so and so, but you know, it it just don't take all that. And I just don't think you have to do all that. And I don't think you have to live that way. And I don't think, and I don't think, and I don't think, and I don't think. And no, you don't think. And that's your problem. You've let everybody sitting around you do your thinking for you. You started walking in the counsel of the ungodly. You started standing in the way with people who break God's law regularly and you got comfortable doing it yourself. And now you're sitting with a bunch of people who not only disagree with the church, they're vocal about their disagreement and, 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 and you feed on each other and you influence each other and you solidify one another in your ungodly, unbiblical way of thinking and position. Why? Because you did not walk you w- did not walk in the counsel of God's word. You got caught up in the uh, corrupt guidance of the world. That's what happens to us. Amen? We sit in the seat of the scoffer. You get liberated. You begin to mock and ridicule and demean those who hold the standards that you used to hold, but you don't anymore. The psalmist says, if we're interested in a life marked by God's favor and blessing, we cannot even start down that road. Blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit in this posture. Who gets comfortable with sin? Blessed is the man who doesn't do that. Number two, notice the correct guidance of God's word. Say that with me. The correct guidance from God's word. Verse two is a contrast to verse one. But, say but. Underline it. It's a a contrast. We do not walk, stand, or sit with the ungodly, the sinner, the scoffer. But our delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law we meditate day and night. There's the contrast. So that notice that first thing. God's word directs our actions. 
Verse 2 is a contrast to verse 1. We turn away from the ungodly and we turn toward the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord. We turn away from those who deliberately choose to disobey God's commands. We turn away, we, we tune out, we unfollow, we block those people who mock and ridicule our faith. And we instead tune in to the word of God. We turn toward the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord. Say the law. The Hebrew word is Torah. It's a beautiful word. I think law is probably an unfortunate translation most of the time. Because in English, law has a negative connotation, right? The law. We don't like the law, right? <laughs> I remember when, a, when a, one of my little boys was a little boy. And uh, we tried to make him buckle up in his booster seat. And he didn't want to buckle up in that booster seat. I was like, you've got to buckle up. You've got to buckle in that seat. He said, I don't want to. I said, well, it's the law. He said, well, I hate the law and the lawmaker. <laughs> he was done. <laughs> I hate the law and the lawmaker. The word law often has a negative connotation, right? We think about blue lights and speeding tickets. And yeah, that's what we think about the law. We don't like the law. But I want to tell you, the Hebrew word does not have a negative connotation at all. The Hebrew word carries the idea of direction or instruction. Whenever you bought your car and you opened the glove box, there was an instruction manual. Now, it's the law, but not the law in a negative way, but it gives you the laws or the principles by which that car can be safely and effectively operated. It tells you what kind of fuel to use and when to change the oil and what kind of filter to replace it with. It gives you the best advice on how to run that vehicle and get the most out of it with the least possible problems and breakdowns and malfunctions. Direction, instruction. It's the instruction manual on how to live it, how to run it. Now, if I'm honest, I don't always read instruction manuals that come with appliances. We tend to take them out, guys, right? We put it together, and then we look on that little sheet to see what these missing parts are there for, right? Yeah, well, why don't I have three of these left over, you know? But if you follow the instructions, you'll get it right the first time. My dad is one of those guys who reads the instructions. He sits down, opens the box, and he reads the whole thing. And after you've put it together, he sits and reads the whole manual on the thing. He just does that. He lives life by the instructions. Can I tell you today, if you and I would understand the word of the Lord, God's law, are, the word law is not negative, it's positive. These are God's instructions. This is the instruction manual on life. This is the way Old Testament people understood God's law. They looked around and said, look at the world around us. People are making a mess out of their lives. They're making a mess out of their marriage and their family and their community and their society. Everything is going poorly around them. And of all people on the earth, God loved us enough to give us the instruction manual on how to live life to the fullest and not make a mess of our life, our relationships, our families, our finances, our society. And the Hebrews understood God's law to be that, instruction, direction, advice on how to live life and not make a train wreck out of it. This is the law of the Lord. And when the Bible talks about the law, strictly it means the book of Deuteronomy, the commands of God. But the first five books were actually called the books of the law, and they tell us the story. Can I tell you what God's word does? It doesn't just give us commands to obey. It gives us the story that we live in. It reframes the story for us. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have Genesis, the third chapter in my life. Because the Bible frames up the world we live in for us. It helps us understand and get our head around it. How do we understand this? Well, it's, this is what God's Word says. God is good. And God made the world completely good. But then something went terribly wrong. Through human disobedience and sin, the door into God's good creation was opened. And sickness and death and Satan and all this stuff entered because of sin and disobedience. And now the world is under the curse of sin and death. And there's bad things that happen. And there's war and famine and disaster. And there's sickness and disease and eventual death. And all these things entered God's good creation because of sin and disobedience giving place to the evil one. But God did not abandon us. 
He entered his creation. He gave us his word. He sent his son. He broke the power of sin and death at the cross and the resurrection. And he sent his spirit for his church to go and announce that and to begin to live in this new kingdom. And he's coming back one day to finish all that he started. And one day we will live in a kingdom free from all these things. And so in the meantime, I can live by faith and I can walk in hope and I can wait in confidence that I live between the coming of Jesus to save me and the coming of Jesus to inaugurate his kingdom and to rescue the world from the horrible world we see around us today. In the meantime, we live in hope. How can you do that, Pastor? Because I understand the story. And I know what page I'm on in the story. I know where I am in the large picture of what God is doing in the world. God's word will do that for you. The the newspaper will tell you what's happening. But the Bible will tell you why it's happening. The word of God will frame up for you the story so you can understand where you are in the book. Amen? That's what the law of the Lord does. Say the law. It's the word of God. And 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If we're going to walk in God's blessing, we've got to allow God's word to direct our actions. So God's word, it directs our actions. And number two, it delights our heart. It's not just, I begrudgingly do what God says. No. Some of us are like that little boy. His daddy forced him down on the seat and buckled him in. And he said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Okay, that's not going to get you a blessed life. Okay? Just stubbornly doing it because you have to. No, we're not only to obey God's word, we are to delight in God's word. It doesn't just direct our actions, it delights our hearts. Notice what he says, verse 2, but his delight, say delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord. He doesn't just obey God's word, he loves God's word. It is the, the delight of his heart. The Bible is not just a list of rules to keep. The psalmist says, if we will delight in God's word and make it the joy of our heart, we will be blessed. The Bible says that the blessed man enjoys God's word and delights in it and esteems it above everything else. It's more important than our food. Say food. Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter to my mouth than honey. Job 23, 12. I have not depressed. Departed from the commandment of your lips, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Years ago in Mississippi, Brother Ratcliffe, the overseer, had a plaque on his desk and it said, If I haven't prayed, I haven't eaten either. That was his rule. If he, didn't, if he was too busy, so busy that he had to go right into work and start the day, if he didn't have time to pray and read the Bible, he didn't have time for breakfast. And that was his rule. If I haven't prayed, I haven't eaten breakfast either. Because if he had to pick, he was going to pray and read God's word and skip breakfast, not the other way around. That's what Job is saying. I have esteemed your word more important than breakfast. It's quiet in the holiness church. Y'all like your breakfast, don't you? I do too. So let's get in God's word. Let's get in God's word. We esteem it over our sleep. Some of you can do without food, but you've got to have your sleep. Listen to the psalmist. At midnight, I will rise and give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I will rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help because I hope in your word. Even if we have to get up early or stay up a little later, we need to make time for God's word. That's what the psalmist says. We esteem it above wealth. Oh, pastor, I know I ought to, but you know, I got to get up and get to work. I've got to make money for my family. I hear you. Hear what the word of the Lord says. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. You can make a little more maybe if you got there a little bit earlier. But I want to tell you your life will be better if you take the first morning hours and you spend some time in the presence of God and in his word. If you will delight in God's word, if you will show God that you love him and you esteem him, then you will have a blessed life. If you will honor the Lord, the Lord will honor you back. 
So if you just want what you can produce in your own human energy, then you go for that. But the Bible says, those who honor me, I will honor. It's sort of like the principle of tithing. I can't explain to you how, why it works. I just know that it works. The 90% that I keep after I give God my tithe goes further than the 100% if I held on to all of it. That doesn't make mathematical sense. No, but it makes spiritual sense because the Bible says, if you honor me, I will honor you. The Lord will bring blessing. The blessing of God is real, church. It's real. God's favor is real. God can touch you with his favor and doors will open for you and good things will come your way and opportunities will avail themselves to you. And if you don't have God's favor, if God's blessing isn't over your life, there's all kind of good things that'll just pass you by and you won't even know because you never saw them coming or going. You just miss out on them because you aren't walking in the favor and the blessing of God. Say, I want to be blessed. Well, blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. God's word designs our minds. His, we meditate in his law. Say meditate. means to mutter, to read it out loud in a low voice, to ponder, to reflect, to, to carefully, diligently seek God's word. When we hear the word meditation, I know what you think. I know what I think. I think about those old movies of people sitting cross-legged on a mat and they've got their fingers like this and they're going, om, right? Eastern meditation is this idea that you need to clear your mind. You need to empty your mind. Now, some of us wouldn't have a whole lot to push out anyway, right? We're about, some of us say, Pastor, I'm about halfway there most days. Just almost empty anyway, right? Just push a little bit out and it's clear. Some of you are like me and you have that, you know, your attention deficit kicks in. There are always a crate of squirrels running around up here. Amen, Steve? Always a crate of squirrels, and we only catch about half of them. And so if you want me to clear my mind, that is not going to happen. It's never clear up here, okay? There's always two or three squirrels loose running around. That's not what meditate means. It's not clearing or emptying your mind. The biblical idea of meditation is not that. The biblical idea of meditation is not emptying your mind, it is filling your mind. Filling your mind with God's Word. Pouring over God's Word. Reading it aloud. Reading it under your breath so you can really focus on it and concentrate on it. Amen? Involve, f- f- involves filling your mind with God's truth. To be formed mentally, emotionally, morally, spiritually into God's image. To be conformed to God's will by listening to His Word. It's continuous action, the tense of the verb. It means we keep on meditating. We do it over and over. It's a habit of life. We meditate day and night. Say day and night. Multiple times and all in between. Always on the back burner. God's word is our passion, our obsession. We're never done with it. We're always pouring back over it. We're always going back through it. I've enjoyed teaching our senior saints on Wednesday mornings. And one of the things they've taught me is this. Every time you go back through the Bible, no matter how many times you've read it, you always see something you never saw before. Why? Not because God's word changes, but because you change. You're not the same person who went through the Bible last year. You aren't facing the same trials you faced last year. You don't need to hear the same thing you heard last year. But every time you go through God's word, the Holy Spirit will point out to you, hey, notice that. Hey, pay attention to that. Hey, write that on an index card and put it on the mirror. That's for you. When we meditate and spend time on God's word, it speaks to us. What is the goal? To be conformed to the will of God, to be transformed in the image of Jesus. We've, whenever you got saved, you got a new heart, but you still have the same old brain. And you've got years of old files up here, and you have to replace those old files and overwrite them with new ones. And the way you do that is by spending time in God's Word. As you pour over it, as you meditate on it, God's Word will overwrite the old way of thinking and living, but you have to spend time meditating on the word. Read it, study it, hear it taught, memorize it, meditate on it. Colossians 3.16 says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Say richly. 
not just a little bit of the Bible, a lot of the Bible. Let it dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. We read the Word of God. We sing the Word of God. We do everything we can to write the Word of God into our heart. We frame it and hang it on the walls in our home. Amen. We make it the screensaver on our phone and our, and our, uh, our computer. We put God's Word where we're going to encounter it. We deliberately interact with it. You need a private devotional life, but you also need public times of gathering to hear God's Word preached like this morning, but we also need times of gathering to study God's Word more deliberately in Bible study groups. I want you to notice before we go today, the third thing is this, the continuing teaching of the church. Say that with me. The continuing teaching of the church. I turn away from the corrupt guidance of the world. I turn toward the correct guidance of God's word. And I plant my life under the continual teaching of God's church. The book of Acts chapter 2 says the first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They parked themselves under somebody who could diligently, faithfully explain God's word to them. The early church used four words to describe teaching and preaching, interacting with God's word. Let me give them to you before we go. Number one, kerygma. It means announcing. Say announcing. When we gather as a church, we are to announce the message of the gospel. Kerygma is the word used to describe what the church preaches about Jesus. The message, the the, the announcement that we are to share with the world. An announcement In biblical times, a king would write a message and he would send it by a herald. And that herald would go and he would open the scroll and sound a trumpet and get everyone's attention. Hear ye, hear ye. And he would announce so that the whole village or community would hear, this is what the king has said. And whenever that herald announced that message, you had been informed of what the king said. And if you got caught disobeying the king, you could say, well, I didn't hear the king say that. He would say, oh, yes, you did. When that herald stood in front of you and read that scroll and said, hear ye, hear ye, you had heard the word of the king. Even though you didn't hear the king say it, you received the message that he sent you and you're accountable for it. So I hear people say, well, you know what? God would just have to speak to me personally. God would have to come talk to me from heaven before I ever believed the gospel. Well, then you'll die and miss heaven. Because what the Bible tells us is that God sends a herald. God sends a preacher. And that preacher stands and opens the book and shares the word of God. And once you hear the message of the gospel, you are accountable before God to to repent of your sins and to believe on Christ and to go God's way. And if you don't, you can't say you did not know the truth of the gospel. To whom much is given, much is required. And so we gather as a church to make an announcement. We don't just share the gospel, we proclaim the gospel. We don't just share it, it's not take it or leave it. We make an announcement. Jesus Christ has conquered death, hell, and the grave. He is the only way to be saved from God's wrath on sin. And he's coming back very soon. And you need to trust and surrender your life to him or you'll be on the wrong side of God's judgment when you face him at the end. That's the announcement. Amen. Kerygma, announce, to declare. I read it this morning. It's what Peter said in Acts chapter 4. Men of Israel, if you wonder, let it be known to you by the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this man stands before you. Neither is there salvation in anyone else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that? That's the gospel. That is the kerygma. That is the announcement of the church. To the world. We are to be announcing the gospel. Say announcing. Number two, we are to be teaching. Say teaching. The Greek word is didike. It's to teach. And the word means to teach doctrine. 
It's to explain doctrine. I know lots of people don't want to hear doctrine. They don't like that. They don't want you to spend a week and preach about the Trinity or spend a week and talk about justification by faith or sanctification or whatever. I want to tell you, your pastor is called to share right doctrine. We're called to teach what the book says. Well, I just want you to tell me how to live daily life. We get to that. That's another word. But you'll never understand how to, what to do if you don't understand God's word at a deep level. You and I need to be taught the right doctrine of God's word. And the church is called to do that. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42 said. People say, well, doctrine divides. It's supposed to divide. That's the point. It divides truth from error, light from darkness. It divides right from wrong. This division is necessary in the same way that a surgeon will divide a cancerous tumor from the healthy tissue of your body. God's word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sworded sword, and it divides sword and spirit, join it, join it, soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is a surgeon's scalpel. It is to divide right from wrong. Amen. So sometimes we talk about tedious things. Not every time you gather to hear a message or a, a, a lesson in Sunday school, it's not always exhilarating. Sometimes it's just driving down the tent stakes of the truth in your heart so that you're able to tell the truth from a lie whenever you hear it. Amen. It's not always exciting or glorious. I'm afraid we have a generation that's hooked on that hooked on exciting and hooked on dopamine and hooked on the, uh, the rush of something new and we've lost the ability to sit down and open God's word and get still and drink deeply and learn what the Bible says. And so we've got people, we got to, if we're not careful, we'll have a generation of people who they can feel God and they want to worship God, but they don't know doctrine. And they can't recognize truth for error when somebody steps up and preaches something that isn't right. They can't tell because they haven't spent enough time in the book to know and discern the difference. It's not just younger people. There are a lot of people who've been in the way a long time who can't tell the difference because they aren't spending a lot of time in God's Word. Paul warns us the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. Paul tells Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Continue in them. For if you do so, you will save yourself and those who hear you. It matters what we believe. It matters. Can good Christians disagree about lesser issues? Sure we can. Unity does not mean uniformity. But can I tell you, the Christian faith does have some hard edges. There are some things we must believe in order to be Christians. And those things are not open for debate. They must be believed in order to be saved. The Christian faith's got some rough corners. The third word for the church's preaching and teaching is applying. Say applying. Homilia, to give a homily, means that you explain how this applies to life. In every one of Paul's letters, he spends the first half of the letter talking about doctrine. This is what we believe. And then in the middle of the book, he puts a big old break and he uses the word therefore. And then he turns the corner. And the rest of the book, he talks about this is how we live because of what we believe. If this is what is true, then this is how it applies to our lives on a daily basis. So we learn what we believe, and then we learn how we apply that to daily life. That's what we teach about in life groups and growth groups and small groups here at the church. We learn how to live this out. Christian preaching and teaching is practical. My faith in Jesus has implications for how I treat my wife, raise my children, perform my job, relate to my neighbors, spend my money, and invest my years of retirement. It has implications for all of life. Some people say, well, I don't, I don't want the preacher telling me how to live. Then stay at the house because that's my job. My job is to faithfully apply God's word and teach us how to live it. Amen. That, that's the way that goes. It is my call to do that. I wouldn't be worth my salt 
if I didn't take God's word and apply it and faithfully talk about how it hits us where we live every week. Amen. Some people, I guess, don't want that in life, but I do. I want somebody to tell me straight and apply the word of God in a faithful way because I want to make it to heaven. I don't want to step in a hole on this trip home. We're too close to heaven. We're too close to home. We've got too much invested in this thing. I need somebody who's just going to tell me the truth and preach it like it's in the book. God said what he meant and he meant what he said. Just tell me what the book said. So park yourself in the word of God. The fourth word is paraclesis. It means exhorting. Say exhort. It can mean to encourage or to warn. But in either case, it is a call to action. Exhorting. You know, I was taught there's two ways to move a mule, right? You can put a carrot in front of him or put a stick behind him. Amen? (laughs) And God's word does both. There are times whenever... We're just bullheaded and stubborn and God has to take his word and he has to put a stick behind us, doesn't he? And he warns us and he he fusses at us and he tells us what's going to happen if we don't straighten up and do what's right. And there are other times we're discouraged and our hearts are heavy and we just need God to hang a carrot out in front of us and say, come on a little further. (laughs) Move, let's go. You can do this. You've got this. That's what exhorting is. It's a stick in one hand and a carrot in the other. To exhort means to call people to act, to encourage us to move along, to keep going in the things of God. I want to tell you, I believe in the day and hour you and I live, this is one of the most important things the church does. We keep one another motivated to live for God because we live in a world that is designed, the pressure of the world, the pull of the devil, all the stuff we go through Monday through Friday, the pressure cooker we live in. Come on, let's be honest for a moment. We live in a world that is throwing everything it can at us to demotivate us to live for God, to obey God, to hold true to our faith and our commitment, to come to church, to, to serve in the church. We live in a world that's pulling on us to do the opposite of that. And we need to gather together and to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to urge one another on in the things of God. Amen. We need to be exhorted. Uh, the Bible often uses the phrase, let us. Say, let us. Whenever you read let us, that is an exhortation. That is the writer exhorting or encouraging us to do something. Hebrews 10 is a letter of exhortation. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of the faith. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. Verse 24, let us consider one another how to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen? In chapter 12, let us, therefore, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, and let us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us, say let us. Amen. Sometimes I need somebody to warn me, to lovingly confront me, to strongly urge me away from sin and lukewarmness back into a right relationship with God. Sometimes I need someone to encourage me, to remind me of the promises of God, to remind me of his power and his presence, to put their arm around me and to pray for me, and to remind me that God's going to help me get through the rough patch I'm in. Maybe you're a believer today whose walk is stagnated Can I tell you today, just as a baby never grows without nourishment, you will never grow up in the things of God without a steady, regular interaction with the Bible. You will not grow up without the Bible. It is God's means of growing you up. And if you aren't making time to interact with the Bible, then you're not going to grow up in your faith. You're always going to just be at best weak and stagnated and not real confident and unsure of what you ought to do and how you ought to go, you have to invest deeply in God's Word. Number one, study privately at home. Develop a Bible reading plan. Don't just jump around in the Bible. Read through books of the Bible. Read through sections of the Bible. Check out the plans on the YouVersion app. 
go through the book of Matthew or the book of Colossians. You can read the book of Colossians in the same time it would take you to read the average newspaper article. You could read the entire book of Colossians. Read it today. Get along with the Lord. If you're struggling to find out where to do it, let me tell you what to do. Go to Sunday school and get a Sunday school book. And every week you can read that Sunday school lesson. And that lesson is what they'll talk about next Sunday. And someone will step up and teach that lesson. But all week long, at the end of that Sunday school lesson, there is a list of Bible passages you can read all week long, one every day, and it's all about the topic that you're studying that week. And if you will just do that every week, read your Sunday school lesson, read those passages of Scripture, and show up for Sunday school. If you will do that for the next 12 months, you will not recognize yourself. Do you hear me? God's word. I didn't say just come to Sunday school now. That's what some of y'all heard. If I come to Sunday school, I'm going to change. If you come to Sunday school and you read that lesson and you read those passages every day, I can guarantee you change will happen in your life. God's word will not return void. God's word will do a work in your life. If God's word created the world around you, imagine what God's word could do if you got it in your life. Get the Word of God in your life. Study it with a group every week. Join a life group at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Come to midweek on Wednesdays at 7. We want to make it easy for you. Uh, we, we have a QR code that um, we are going to share with you today. If you scan that right there on the screen, take out your phone. Preacher said you could. Take out your phone and scan that QR code off one of those screens. It will take you to a link where we have all of our Bible study groups listed. Sunday morning groups, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night groups, you can find a Bible study group to join and to become part of if you're not already in one. Come and join us for those. Come and see me at the pastor's table today. Come and see me or, or Casey back there. We can get you signed up for one of these groups. But you will never grow unless you take God's word seriously, both directions. You need a private time of interacting with God's Word every day. You also need to be part of a Bible study group. Well, Pastor, if I'm reading the Bible on my own, why do I need to come be part of a Bible study group? Because other people will see things that you don't see in a passage. Other people will share things you never thought about in a passage. You need to be there because of what you can receive. But you also need to be there for what you can give. You will understand and see some things. You will have a testimony about how God brought you through something. And you will be, have an opportunity to share with somebody else in the room what good thing God's done for you and how this passage helped you to walk with God faithfully. So come for what you can give and what you can receive. When we do that together, great things happen. We don't come to the house of God empty so that the person up front can pour into us and fill us up. We all come to God. We all come together to church with something in our tank if we've been studying God's word. And when you get together in a class, we have an opportunity to pour into one another so that everybody leaves full. That's why you want to be part of a Bible study group. So you can leave full every week. Amen. Stand with me all over God's house. I'm aware of the time if you're not a Christ follower, let me challenge you today. God has a great plan for your life. But you will never discover God's plan for your life on your own. You are never going to just stumble into it and get it right by yourself. The only way you will ever walk in God's plan for your life is if you surrender your life to His Son, the Lord Jesus. God sent His Son to deal with your sin Every time you've broken God's commandments, it has separated you. It's built a wall between you and God so that you can't hear from God and you, you can't receive from God. That wall can be brought down today. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven. And that wall of separation for, between you and God could be torn apart at the cross. When you ask God to forgive you of your sins, when you commit your life to Christ and agree to live for Him the rest of your life... That wall of division between you and God is taken away. Your heart is reunited with God in relationship. 
And then you can hear from God and you can grow in God's word and you can live among God's people and you can learn how to do life a different kind of way. Are you there this morning? If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, could I urge you to do that? I said last week, you can be in church and not be in Christ. It's not enough just to come to the house of God. You need to have a personal relationship with God by trusting His Son, the Lord Jesus. Begin reading God's Word for yourself. Start with the book of John, the fourth book of the New Testament. See what happens. If you don't have a Bible, I can give you a free copy of one today before you leave. Maybe you're ready for a break from your old life. Maybe you're ready for a drastic change today. Then surrender your life to Christ this morning. Surrender to Him. But if you're a Christian and you're stuck, I want to tell you this. Our general overseer, Tim Hill, has a great little statement, and I think it'll mean a lot to us. Listen to me. You will never be more spiritual than you are scriptural. You will never be more spiritual than you are scriptural. You will never have a stronger Christian life until you go deeper in God's Word. It's the only way. We gather and worship and prayer, but we go deep in God's Word by studying it on our own and in groups together. We worship in rows, but we grow in circles when we pull people around us to help us understand God's Word. Are you doing that? I'm afraid a lot of us during the pandemic let go of some of these practices that really had anchored us for a long time. You don't have to raise your hand or agree with me. I I just know it. There are lots of people who lost their grip on their private devotional life, personal prayer, time in God's Word, Bible study. They aren't investing in those things anymore. And because of that, they have ceased to grow. They have stopped putting their roots down. And you can tell the difference. They don't have the joy and the peace they used to have. They don't have the assurance. They're more worried and anxious than they used to be. All these things have come upon us. Why? Because we have lost our footing in the disciplines of the Christian faith. We've lost our footing. And I want to tell you today, some of us, the best thing we could do to improve our walk with God and enhance our relationship with Christ this week would be something that's going to sound very unspiritual to you. Set your clock 30 minutes early every morning this week decide before you wake up what you're going to read in God's Word and take 20 minutes to read God's Word and then take 10 minutes and sit down and pray about everything that's causing you anxiety or worry or fear in your life. Do you hear me? Half an hour investment every morning this week. God's Word and then pray. And if you will reinvest and redig the well of those kinds of disciplines in your life, you will see the return of God's peace and God's assurance and joy and all those deep things. Give the Lord a hand of praise. This is the truth today. But but I'm just telling you the truth now. Listen, if you come and you say, well, you know, if we just had a hotter service, I think I can make it through the week. No. No, no. We... Don't come empty and have great services in this room. We have great services in this room when we come full. Do you hear me? We don't come to pray. We come having already prayed. We don't come for the teacher to teach us something new. We come having already read the lesson, already studied the book, ready to contribute to the lesson. Do you hear me? We don't come for the preacher to say something we haven't heard. We come for the preacher to remind us and reinforce us of what we already know because we've already been in the book. And when we do that, we don't come empty. We come full. Amen. 
And then we don't walk into God's house saying, oh, I'm on the bottom. I need somebody to pull me up. No, we walk in going, I am thankful because God has worked great and mighty things in my life this week. Amen. I've got victory. God has answered prayers for me. God has strengthened me with his word this week. And I've come in with my mind on the Lord. And I'm ready to worship. And I'm ready to pray. And I'm ready to go in. And if you're not, then you can light your candle off mine because mine's already lit. Do you hear me? So stop coming in every week with your wick blowed out. And start coming in every week with your fire brightly burning because you are fueling your own lamp with prayer and the Word of God. Do you hear me today? You used to didn't have to tell Christian people to pray and read the Bible, but it has come to the point now where you've got to restate the obvious. If we are not praying and reading God's Word, we're going to run on empty. We're going to burn out. So this week, every day, 30 minutes at least, spend some time in God's Word, spend some time in prayer, and then join us back here on Wednesday night at 6.30 as we walk in this room. And for uh, about an hour, hour and 10 minutes, we're just going to press into God's presence. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God. But don't come empty. Amen. Listen, I don't know if I'm mad or anointed. Hear me. Don't come empty. No one comes and says, oh, I'm empty, Pastor. I need you to all fill me up. No, no, no. Come filled. Come overflowing. Come walking in the reality of this. And then let's gather together Wednesday night. And then we'll go to a whole other level. Because we didn't show up empty to get full. We showed up full, ready to pour out and do what God wanted us to do in prayer and in worship. But we need to start there. Not have to get there by the end of a service. Does this make sense to anybody? Well, pastor, we just don't have services like we used to because people don't pray and fast at home like they used to. Do you hear me? It's not the fault of the preacher not preaching or the choir not singing. It's the fault of the saints not praying. Because the difference between the way it used to be and the way it is now is people used to come from a week. They came from a life of time alone with God in prayer and in study and when they came to God's house they didn't have to be pumped up or propped up they were ready they walked in ready to worship ready to pray, ready to fight ready to serve, ready to do whatever God called them to do so I want to tell you we've got to do our part at home in order to be ready to come to God's house amen Don't do your homework on the bus on the way, amen? Get your homework done at home. Saints, we've got some homework to do. Say homework. Read the Bible and pray every day this week. Press deep in your roots and you'll grow, amen? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I love you and I thank you. And Lord, I thank you for your people today. And I pray God today, and I'm gonna ask us to raise a hand and make a commitment. I'm not gonna ask us to sign off on a card or anything like that. But Lord, I pray today that people all over this room, if they do not already have that discipline built into their lives, I pray that today would be the day they say, for the next week, I am going to do what Pastor said. I am going to set my clock. I'm gonna mark out some time, whether it's early or late, but I'm going to pick me a 30-minute window and I'm going to spend time in prayer and I'm going to spend time in God's Word. And I'm going to come Wednesday night and I'm going to show up full, not empty, because I've already been in God's presence. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that. And I pray that you will help us not only to cultivate it personally, but to cultivate it publicly, to gather for study, for prayer, for worship, and to plug into a great life group or Bible study group here at the Hill. Sunday morning at 9, Wednesdays at 7. Lord, help us, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. God's people said. Would you give the Lord a great hand of praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank God for His fullness. Thank Him for His power, for His help, and for His grace. Amen. Did it feel good to be in one service? Amen. Feel good to be in one service. Amen. If you normally come to the 1115 service, wave. 11.15, wave. 9 o'clock people, these are the congregation members that you may not have met yet. Keep waving. All right. This is the rest of your church, (laughs) y'all. Amen. Some of you haven't seen each other since last March. So uh, glad to be in worship today, man. Don't forget, you can meet us uh, at the back. We'll help you sign up, find a group. 
Uh, if you're new to the church, Shay and I want to meet you and shake your hand. Uh, get to meet, meet you. We'll be at the pastor's desk right back here at the back for just a minute. And then we're meeting our college and career group for lunch. So we'll be slipping out real quick. Uh, but we hope to see you Wednesday morning Bible study in the Ed Building. Wednesday night, 6.30, the gathering right here. Amen. Next Sunday, Pastor Appreciation. Brunch is at 9. Service is at, uh, is at 10, about 10.15. We may be a little longer on the brunch. We'll get in here about 10.15 or 10.20 and get rolling. You're going to have a great week. Amen. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift His countenance upon us and grant us peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen and amen.